Okay, hi everyone. We are on to our next set of modalities, which is our thermal modalities. So in here we're going to talk about using cryotherapy, which is cold therapy, and thermotherapy, which is heat therapy. So in order to start that conversation, um, we are going to do a little background in how heat is transferred and what are the physiological effects of transferring heat into and out of the body. Um, we are going to then start our modality conversation with cold first, cryotherapy first. Then you'll have a quiz on the cryotherapy. Then we'll move into um, a little bit on intermittent compression, which usually goes hand in hand with um, cold therapy because a lot of times they're combined. So that's the chapter 14. So you'll have a quiz on that. And then we'll get into our heat modalities, our thermotherapy modalities. And you'll have um, a quiz on that before we get to our exam. So let's start with that introduction kind of into thermodynamics and thermomodalities. So you should have watched um, on uh, the Moodle page. I have some videos up there about um, heat transfer and how heat is transferred and to let you review a little bit of that. And now this will go specifically into talking about the modalities themselves. So when we're talking about heat transfer, like we saw in the videos, we're always going from areas of more energy or what we would consider warmth to areas of less energy or what we would consider cold or cool. And in doing that, we create um, a temperature gradient, which is this gradual change in temperature from the interior of one object to the interior of the other object, specifically when we're talking about conduction, which is one of the mechanisms for the heat transfer that you saw. Okay. As the temperature gradient increases, so as that difference between the heat in one, the temperature of one object and the temperature in the other, as that increases, um, we get an increase in the speed of the exchange that happens, and that's Fourier law. Um, so when we refer to that, the fact that if one object is much more hot than another object, it's going to have a higher um, speed of that exchange than two objects that are closer together. So again, like I said, there's um, the three main heat transfers when we're talking about general thermodynamics. We have conduction, convection, and radiation. And then we have evaporation, which is what happens within the body in order to help maintain body temperature. So when we talk about our modalities, each modality that we talk about being a thermal um, modality is going to have some form of this heat transfer. And most of them have multiple types included into one. So conduction would be, again, um, touch, so two surfaces um, in direct contact with each other. And so that would be like an ice bag or a hot pack. Convection is that flow of fluid. So when we talk about the cold whirlpools, um, or warm whirlpools, slush buckets. We'll also talk about um, flutotherapy a little bit. That would all be convection. And then radiation, um, where it transfers in from the object, that's going to be much more like our um, uh, diathermy and some of our deeper uh, forms of, um, of heat transfer that we're going to have. And, and all three of these happen, too, because obviously the, the heat pack is in the air, and so it's going to heat the air around it. So you're also going to have convection. It's going to radiate off heat, so you're also going to have radiation. And then when it reaches the body, the body's going to try to maintain its core body temp through potentially sweating, through evaporation. Um, the equation that's over here, this is for um, the ch heat transfer specifically with conduction. But it kind of gives you a good idea of all those things that are going to um, affect heat transfer. And so heat transfer takes into account what's called the thermal conductiveness or the conductivity of the tissues. So each tissue that goes through the body is going to have um, a different level of conductivity. So some are going to be more insulators, some are going to be more conductors. So there's a different value for this. So we don't actually study that value or know that value. We just know kind of in general which tissues are going to be. But um, every tissue has its own value, and, and you can find those in places. The A is the area through which the energy is being transmitted. So the skin-to-skin -skin contact, again, between the ice bag and the skin or the hot pack and the skin. Um, what is that area? Then we have the T is the time that the modality is applied. 
And then we have our change in temperature. So this is that temperature gradient okay, between the modality and tissue. So how much different in temperature are those two objects? And then the distance, so the change in length. So the distance separating the thermal gradient. Okay. So again, the K is going to differ with tissues. The skin that's in contact, the surface area, so the size of the modality we choose, and then that distance from the modality to the target tissues. So when you think about putting an insulating layer, putting a towel or something under an ice bag or a hot pack um, with a towel underneath it, that insulating area is going to decrease the energy exchange in, in two ways. It's going to affect the heat transfer in two ways. It's an insulator, so it has a different K value we have to take into account that's going to um, have a lower thermal capacity. And it's also going to increase the distance between the modality and the skin. So when we apply heat to the body, again, our body is going to try to um, maintain core body temp. So either applying when we apply cold or apply heat. And so we have thermoreceptors in our body that respond to temperature, just like we were talking about nociceptors um, when we talk about pain. We have more cold thermoreceptors than we have warm, but we still have plenty of both. And if it's overwhelmed, if those thermoreceptors become overwhelmed, if there's too much heat or too much cold, um, a pain response is set. Um, so that's, that's important to keep in mind as well. And so we want to listen to what the body is telling us about the heat transfer. So the goal for thermal, hot and cold applications is to alter the cell metabolism in the body. That's how we're going to get our physiological effects. That's going to be why we use the heat and the cold. And so for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, or that's approximately 1 degree Celsius, of an increase or a decrease in tissue temperature, we get about a 13% change in the metabolic rate. So if we go up 1.8 degrees, we're going to get about 13% more cellular activity. If we go down 1.8 degrees, we're going to get about 13% less um, cellular activity. So again, that's going to be important when we go set up our goals for our treatments. So like we mentioned in that equation, tissue type is going to affect um, how the heat is transferred and whether that um, tissue is our target tissue or not is going to be important. So usually at skin level, kind of resting temperature is about 91 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 degrees Celsius. Um, muscle, so as we go deeper, muscle is usually about 95 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees or 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. And so skin really becomes very affected by a couple different things. Ambient temperature, humidity, um, if we've been exercising, the time of day, um, as well as food that we've eaten, alcohol that we drank, all that will affect skin temperature. And skin temperature can adapt really well. It will, um, the body will engage and, and try to keep that, that um, temperature consistent. As you go deeper, we have more natural heat because our cells are more active and we always produce heat um, with cellular activity. Another type of tissue that's going to be really important as we talk about applying heat or cold is adipose tissue. And so subcutaneous fat and adipose tissue is going to dramatically affect how we can transfer that heat into the tissues that are our target. The more adipose tissue we have, we're going to, that's going to increase, again, both the L in that equation, as well as the K value. We're going to have um, a, a less thermal conductivity with, with adipose tissue. And so if we're going over areas of thicker adipose tissue, we have to adjust usually our treatment times um, because we can't really adjust, adjust the intensity of the heat without overwhelming the skin and, and the structures overlying it and, and potentially causing burns or frostbite. Um, and so we're going to adjust our treatment times. So these are those typical um, treatment times from this one study showing that as we increase the depth of the adipose tissue, and this is measured from skin calipers, so just like we did for um, body composition in um, uh, medical topics, okay, you would use that over the tissue area to measure how many millimeters of adipose tissue we have. And you can see how dramatically that has to increase. If we have that um, 
that number available to us, we can we can make adjustments to again try to be making sure that we are targeting our our specific tissue that we're interested in. So again, one study showed that at eight millimeters of, of adipose tissue, at less than uh, eight millimeters of fine ice, um, we got about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit per minute per centimeter within the muscle. So that's how quickly the temperature was decreasing. If we went up to 10 to 18 millimeters, that decreased from 1.3 to 0.81. So it slowed the cooling that we were getting. And then if you got greater than 20 millimeters, we were at 0.45 degrees Fahrenheit per minute per centimeter of um, adipose, of muscle tissue there. And so we dramatically stopped the amount of cooling. And so most of the research has been on the cooling side, um, so putting ice on, but it also would affect superficial heating as well. On the flip side, so it might take longer for us to get that cooling or that heating, but it's also going to be slower for that tissue underneath the adipose to either rewarm or recool. So if we're applying ice to that area and we get the temperature drop that we want because we do a longer treatment, that intermuscular um, temperature is going to slowly rewarm compared to the skin or other surfaces that don't have that cover of adipose tissue. Another law that comes into effect with tissue type is the law of growth of striper, which basically says that um, you need enough energy to be able to reach your target tissue in order to have physiological effects. So any energy absorbed at the superficial level and the superficial layers is not available to then be transmitted to deeper layers. And so we automatically get less heating and cooling the deeper we go. And so if we need to target something deeper, we have to think and make sure that we have enough energy to get to those target tissues or the treatment's going to be ineffective. We're not going to actually... Um, get the physiological effects that we're claiming. So what are the goals of our two different types of thermal uh, modalities? And this is going to be kind of in general, and we're obviously talking more about the specific physiological effects as we move forward. But for cold, we're going to decrease cell metabolism. Okay, we're going to, that's our main goal. We're going to try to slow down the cell activity. Heat does the opposite. We're going to increase cell metabolism. Cold, we're going to be best for when acute inflammatory response is active, so we're within that inflammatory response phase. Heat is going to be best for when we try to control inflammation reactions in either the subacute or the chronic stages, so specifically usually proliferation and maturation phases. Uh, cold, much that we um, seem to be counterintuitive to that, is actually really good when someone needs to begin um, range of motion exercises, but they're still limited by a little bit of um, the residual pain from the injury. So we can use cold to kind of deaden that pain, and then they're much more likely to start um, their range of motion exercises um, sooner. Um, cold is also good for um, after physical activity to, again, decrease that cell metabolism. Um, there's a lot of debate on that right now of whether that's actually good or not. You know, the whole just icing after practice or whatever that might be. Um, there's a lot of debate on that right now. Some saying good things, some saying negative things. Um, but one of the main reasons we use cold post activity or post um, when we're not in that acute phase is pain relief. It works as an analgesic. Um, and we get pain relief from it. And so people will continue to usually use it for that reason. Goals again on the heat side there, we are trying to encourage tissue healing. We promote venous and lymphatic drainage. It actually helps to reduce edema and ecchymosis if we are past that acute inflammatory response phase. That's really important. So it helps reduce the edema that has gathered from the inflammatory response phase um, once we're through that. If we were to use heat too early, we would actually increase the inflammation and increase swelling. But if we use it at the appropriate time, it can be um, really good to promote that venous and, and lymphatic drainage in order to help reduce the edema and the ecchymosis. And then it can be used to improve range of motion before physical activity or rehabilitation if that would normally be limited due to stiffness or a little bit of soreness, um, it can have some really good effects there.